Hi, brother, and I want to speak to you this afternoon of what we have in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 to 15. So why don't you go there? We're going to read this. Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. The Apostle says, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Now, obviously, we started last week this sort of series, and honestly, it really began with this passage. Uh, and it began, some of you are aware of this, but it began uh, a couple of weeks ago on a Monday night at Dave's house as he looked at the humility of Christ and um, really the, the command that you find in the previous section to do nothing out of selfish ambition and conceit. And as I just continued reading, I just came to this passage, and I'll be honest with you, this is a passage that I have come to many times as I've just read through the Bible, read through Philippians, and it has come to me always with such force of seemingly impossibility to actually be obedient to it. Um, and so I thought to myself, that seems to me the most difficult command in all the Bible. Um, and so we began to discuss and, and pray and think about what we wanted to do uh, in the next couple of weeks. And as you know, we began last week talking about these difficult commands in the Bible. And not, not any detriment to the, the messages that Aaron and Manny will bring also, but in my own heart, this seems to me, brethren, the most difficult command that I can find in Scripture. And here's the reason for that. Now, you may think there are all number of different commands in the Bible that are very difficult to be obedient to. And, and maybe even in your own individual walk right now, you may think this thing is impossible, seemingly impossible for me to do. Whatever it might be, there were different times in my life where I felt like different sins had sort of had a grip on me. And it seemed like that command was the hardest command. But the reason I think this is the most difficult is because it hits us at the very foundation of the sinful heart. The heart that is not, the heart that's dissatisfied. I mean, you remember it was Adam in the garden and, and honestly, at the root of it, what is it? He's dissatisfied in what God has given to him. God has told him, you may eat of any tree. You just can't eat of that tree. And he was dissatisfied of that. And I think this command hits us right at the core of the sinful heart. And because of that, and because of the fact, and you and I know this as a reality, the day in, day out, um, maybe the word opportunity isn't the right word, but, but the amount of time that is presented to you, the events in your life that are ripe for complaining. You know, I mean, it's almost unending. It's as though you cannot go even 10 minutes without something happening to you that you feel an urge to complain about. You feel a necessity. It's like it just creeps. It's like it's like Elihu in the book of Job. Something happens and you're like, oh, I must speak. I got to find relief. I just got to complain about this thing. And, and we know that. And that's why I, I just I find it so confronting to us. The apostle tells us, do all things without grumbling and disputing. And brethren, I, I come to that text and I find it to be almost an impossible thing to do that because of the consistency with which we are faced uh, with needing to apply that text. So, um, I just I want to state right up front something to you that we'll circle back, that we'll circle back to. But uh, I, I just want to, to give you a little bit of general idea here. I, I have entitled this, Stop Complaining. 
And I know full well, obviously, that that word is not even in the passage. But the reason I'm naming it that is because I think that the idea, stop complaining, is what the apostle is getting at with two other words. And what I would simply say is I think that our complaining comes about by either grumbling or disputing or both. And we'll come back to that. I'll explain that a little bit later on. But I want you to see that because pretty much from this point forward, I'm going to be using the word complaining. And I obviously recognize that that word isn't found there. So I, I just I don't want you getting you know caught over in the weeds somewhere wondering why I'm doing that. And also, I, I want to state something else that was brought up last week. Um, and this is going to be somewhat of introductory thoughts. Aaron said some things last week that were important. And there are some things this week that I want to bring to light as well, just as we sort of really begin to step off into this series. But he had brought up last week something that is super important. And it is so important that we get this early on in the life of a church. Aaron brought up last week that we need to be careful that we do not undercut the seriousness of biblical commands by simply saying, oh, well, Jesus died for us in the gospel and our sins are forgiven. And as though we would implicitly just, it, it's like we need some kind of reassurance in ourselves because we recognize that we sin and we fall short of what God desires us to. But brethren, we have to be careful that we're not going far too quickly to say, oh, but brethren, thank God Jesus died for us. And thank God that that's not a standard we're held to for righteousness sake. Listen, brethren, we know that. We know that the Bible teaches that you are not saved by your good works. The Bible teaches that you are not saved by your obedience to never grumbling. But if we are too quick to just dismiss the seriousness and the weightiness of these commands, we will not carry the weight of it and therefore apply it in our daily lives. We just won't do it. And I'm going to tell you right now, the urgency with which these biblical commands, all of the ones that we're going to look at, the urgency with which they come to us from the text requires us to say, God's word demands me to do this. And I cannot just, I, I can't just push some of that weight off because it makes me feel weighed down. You have got to hear the command. You've got to hear it come to you in all of its weight. And, and we got to deal with it. And there's a lot of ways that we need to deal with it. But we can't just try to push it away because it's too confronting. And we can't just try to reassure ourselves with any gospel truth that we could come up with so that we don't have to obey it. We do have to obey it. It's there for us to obey. It's pressed upon us. And so we want to hold firmly the reality of the free forgiveness of Jesus Christ that can come to any sinner, but we will not let go of the essential life of holiness that a Christian must walk in. The Bible demands that. We must do it, brethren. We will not treat the demands of holiness in the Bible. Like, I mean, any of you who have lived here long enough, you know this. You go outside, you walk through some weed maybe in someone's front yard, and you get one of those little bramble bush stickers in your shoe. And immediately, what do you, you got to get that thing out of there. The quicker you get rid of the discomfort and get it away from me, and then I can continue on my way. And we don't want to treat biblical commands like that. That this is a discomfort in my shoe, and I just want to get rid of it as fast as I possibly can. So what's my point? Well, here's the point. When we bring these commands to bear in all of these messages, in this one and the ones to follow, I've thought of three basic outcomes that we want. We want these outcomes. And all of them are good and godly, none of which are bad. So the first one is that we intend them. This is purposeful, brethren. We intend them to bring conviction and repentance. That is purposeful. We want these commands to bring conviction to the souls and the, and the hearts of God's people. We want that, brethren. Why? Because it's through that that God gives grace of repentance. 
That is a grace. When God gives his people, we looked at Zechariah uh, for two weeks in a row. And one of those passages is that God said, when they look on him whom they have pierced, he will give them pleas for mercy. Brethren, when we look at these commands in Scripture and we see that we fall short of God's righteousness, God's calling upon His people, that is meant to bring us conviction. And it's meant for us to go, I got to go to the Lord in repentance. And that's intended, brethren. That is intended. We need to come and we need to confess our sin. We need to confess our failure. We need to make it known to the Lord. He already knows, brethren. He knows that you all sit here and you have fallen into this sin. He knows that you sit here and, as Aaron spoke about last week, have had unforgiveness in your heart. He knows that you'll sit here and have, have committed each and every sin that we deal with over the next couple weeks and over the life of the church. He knows it. And so pretending like we're not perfect is no good and godly thing. Brethren, there are some times in the midst of a church where confession of sin is feared. The, even confession of sin from the pulpit is feared. Confession of sin as a whole is feared. Listen, if you there's a whole row right there of books on revival that have happened throughout history. You pick up any one of those books and I will tell you what you find. You will find people before that revival has ever broken out coming to the Lord in confession of sin every time. That's what it first begins with. It begins with people cleansing their hearts. The Bible says that. James tells us that. Cleanse your hearts, you double-minded. Draw near to God and He will draw near to you. There are connections with those things. And so, brethren, recognizing your sin and confessing it does not make you a terrible Christian. That makes you a biblical Christian. That's what they do. They see their sin and they confess their sin. So we intend for that, brethren. God wants sincerity. He wants genuineness in your heart. And sometimes that comes in us going to the Lord and saying, Lord, I am a failure here. And I have felt that this week, brethren. I have felt that this week in this text. Number two would be an absolute determination to kill sin and to walk in godliness. Psalm 119, David says this, The Lord is my portion. I promise. He says, I promise to keep your words. Folks, this is determination. And this is what we want. We want a heart that wants that type of thing. We want our motivation to be that. We want to say, Lord, I promise to do this. And then you go out and you do it. You go out and you begin to apply it. You go out and you think. You, as, the, as you had in the Old Testament, that they were supposed to write it on their hands, write it on their forehead, and write it on their doorposts. It's supposed to be posted everywhere so they remember it. And brethren, we need that. We, want it. we need a mind that says, Lord, I promise to do it, and I will do whatever it takes that I could walk in obedience. Determination to kill sin. And the third one is this. Brethren, we need a thankful heart to God that when we fail that we can come before His throne, that we can come and we can, we can bring that strong plea, like the hymn says, I have a great high priest who, whose name is love, whoever lives and intercedes for me, that that's true. When the Bible says that if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. That's true. That's biblical. God says that. If you would do it, I will forgive it. If you will come, I will forgive. I was talking about this with Andre this morning. Jesus gives us promises. If you are heavy burdened, come to me and I will give you rest. But what do we find Christians doing? They feel heavy burdened and they feel like God won't accept them. But God has specifically given you that promise. If you're burdened, he says, come, it's for you. That's who it's for. It's not for for the one that's not burdened. It's not for the one who doesn't care. God specifically tells you, Christian, if you are burdened and labored by your sin, come. I promise you rest. It is yours to have. And so, brethren, we need a thankful heart that we can come to God for that. 
that, that there is forgiveness there. And the reality is, if you were reading maybe a set of directions, you would probably find right there, return back to step one and repeat. Okay, we, we, we come to the Lord, we come in repentance, we come in confession, we make determination to be obedient and walk in righteousness, and, and, and we seek to do that. And then down over here, if we stumble and fall, I mean, what does the proverb say? The righteous, though he fall seven times, what does he do? Does he stay there and wallow in his sin? No, the proverb says he gets up. So we fall and we get up again. And we go back over here and we come to the Lord in repentance. We come in confession, real, genuine confession and repentance. We make determination to walk in righteousness and we do that. So brethren, all three of those things are important and we intend that those things come about through these passages. So all that introductory aside, here's, here's what we have. Let's just take a little inventory of where we're going. The passage has one command and one purpose. Now you could obviously break this down a lot more, but I'm, I intend to keep it simple. One command, one purpose. And as I said earlier, the command could be simply this. Stop complaining. Stop complaining. And the purpose, I could say, would simply be this. Stop complaining so that your light does not become dull and your witness be useless to a watching and sinful world. And we're going to deal with both of those. So here's where we will begin. Brethren, my call to you is this, to stop complaining, to put it to death, to not be those that complain and grumble and mumble their way through life. Now, obviously that assumes that you are in fact one who does complain, but I have no doubt that you being from the same stock as I am, and sin having itself deep in your bones, in your corrupted self, that, that that is exactly what you are, one who complains, and probably one who even complains far more than you think you do, because I have found that to be the case all this week. I have, brethren, and listen, some of you who, who have have stood in a place like this and preached God's word, you know how it is. You're going you're gonna to prepare a sermon for God's people and you intend to preach to them some truth and God intends in the process of doing that to teach you some truth. And so uh, this week, right out of the gate, I mean, I show up and most of you are not going to have a clue what this means except one guy in the room, but you can ask him and he will tell you this would surely be quite frustrating. Uh, but right out of the gate, I, I leave my house on Monday and I go to my first job at work and it's supposed to be a very simple job. I'm supposed to replace some parts and a lady's toilet should take me maybe 10 minutes uh, and everything goes wrong and I leave her house after three hours. So the, the Lord, the Lord uh, right out of the gate is, is thoroughly testing me. Will you do this without grumbling and complaining? Uh, and, and, and brethren, I will tell you right now, and this is the reality of this text. All week, I had to declare all-out war against this sin of the mind. All-out war. There's no sense of passivity is going to allow this thing to be outrooted out of your life. It just simply won't happen. If you're going to if you're going to put this sin to death, you are going to have to declare war against it. And you know what else you're going to have to do? I think Joey ended up getting this book today from First Baptist. John uh, Owen wrote a book called The Mortification of Sin. And in that book, he speaks in terms of warfare. If, if someone is going to come against you in war, what you need to do is, is plan. Okay, they're going to come this way, or they could come this way, or maybe they could come that way. How do we need to set our defenses? How do we need to orchestrate ourselves so that the war can be won? 
And that, brethren, is you're not going to win this battle unless you, unless you go that way against this sin. And so all week I had to deal with that. I, I, there's no passivity that could work here. This was all-out war in my life against this sin. And so here's the deal. You know this to be the case. We are a people gr- prone to grumble. We are a people prone to complain. We, we grumble, we complain, we dispute against God, like the, like the passage of the Israelites that we read, a couple of them. I mean, listen, if you've read your Old Testaments even a little bit, it's, it's almost as though that's their M.O. What are they doing? They're complaining all the time. They're complaining over here. You go a couple more pages, they're complaining again. You go a couple more pages, they're complaining again. It's like that's, they're just really good at that. They complain. And we read it and we go, why are they complaining? God rained bread from the heavens. And then they complain that they want meat. And God says, you want meat? I'm going to give you some meat. So these people complain. That's what they do. And we read those passages. So we do that. We grumble. We complain against God. We grumble and complain against our fellow man. We grumble and complain against other Christians. We grumble and complain in our own circumstances. Brethren, the reality is it's a plague. If you would but honestly examine your own life, you would realize that it is a plague. It covers so much of your life. All these different areas, it's just complaining and grumbling and murmuring and disputing with God and with other people. But even though that is the case, the, the command is quite simple. Actually, it's, it's about as simple as it can possibly get. The command is don't do it. There's no extra fluff. The apostle says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. He's saying, don't do it. Don't complain. But, but why is it that that is so hard for us to do? Why does that seem impossible? We look at that and we see, do all things. Do everything and never complain. I mean, if you're going to put it in a different light, that's what he's saying. But why is it that that hits us and it's like, that's imp- how am I supposed to do that? Because there's other things that we might find in the Scripture that don't seem as difficult to do. I mean, you, you might think of a, a, a number of things in your own life that are just, you know, if, if I tell my wife, the stove is on, don't touch it. She's not over at the stove fighting an urge to stick her hand on top of it. And I know that's not a biblical command, but you recognize that. There are things in life where we are told don't do it, and it's like, I don't want to do that, so that doesn't bother me. But here we read this, and it's telling us, don't do it. And something inside of us is going, well, I don't know if I could do that. How am I supposed to do that? That that is so deep-rooted. And here's the reason why, brethren. People grumble because they think that they deserve something better. That's why we do it. That's why we complain. You have a sinful heart, just like it was in the garden, that says, I want something different. I want something better. What I have, either in this circumstance or in this event or or in this person, what I have, what God has saw fit in His providence, I don't like. And I want something else. I want something different. Brethren, people that grumble and complain are dissatisfied. They dispute with God. Because they think themselves to be a better God than God. That's at its foundation. And I know we hear that and it's like, well, I don't think that. I know God's a better God than I am. Well, then why are you complaining? Why is it that day in and day out God is doing as He is doing and then you complain about it? Because in your heart, there is a sinful brokenness that says, I'm dissatisfied. I'm not happy. I have no joy There's nothing, I mean, I don't know if you remember this. Don't say if you didn't, because it would hurt my soul. But but I, I spoke about this in Ecclesiastes, this reality that we are to be occupied with joy, constantly occupied with joy. And we're not when we're complaining. We're not when we're disputing and grumbling. And so the command comes to us very simply. Don't do it, brethren. Don't complain. Don't grumble. 
And here's a number of ways where we need to see that take place in our lives. In the context, it would seem one very important connection is that we do not grumble or dispute or complain with God Himself, and especially in reference to obedience, which God calls us to. You see, just a little bit before that, in verse 12, the Apostle Paul tells the Philippians, As you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. He's telling them, Obey, brethren. Don't just do it when I'm with you, but be obedient even when I'm not with you. Be obedient when you don't have another Christian standing right next to you to know whether you're obedient or not. And then he hits us with this. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. So here's the deal. You, you may think that obedience can come in two forms. Either joyful obedience or begrudging obedience. People can be obedient to God with joy in their heart and, and excitement to follow Him, or they can obediently do the thing that God wants them to do like a robot, but they would do it begrudgingly. But if you have kids, you would know by probably, by probably saying this to them that disgruntled obedience is no obedience at all. When I ask my son to do something and he screams his mind, off, his face off all the way over to do it, that's not obedience. When I know that he is fighting me, but he's simply doing it just so he doesn't get disciplined, that's not obedience. So the reality is true obedience is only obedience that's done with joy in the heart, without complaining, without grumbling. And Peter gives us an example of this. 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Brethren, he's saying, show hospitality to, to the other brothers and sisters, and in the midst of it, don't pity yourself. Don't complain about it. Brethren, what good is it to be hospitable and bring people into your home and the whole time you're doing it, you're wishing they weren't in your home? That just, it totally defeats the purpose. So, so we're getting confronted by Peter that says, don't just show hospitality, but you need to do it with joy, with cheerfulness, that you're excited that these people are in your home. And I'll tell you right now, brethren, this is something that God brought home to me this week. I mean, you all, many of you know this. Most days, there are people in my home. And, and that's the nature of the situation. My house on the block is the biggest one out of the three of us. And so it's, it's just easier for everybody to be here. And sometimes that can be difficult for me. Sometimes that can be difficult, not because I don't love any of you or because I don't love the fellowship. I do. I want you all here. There are just times where it, in, in my spirit, it's, I don't know why it is like that, because the, there's so much joy in the fellowship that's had. And it's as though Satan wants to come in and try to destroy that by making me, you know, uh, caught up in my mind about this little thing or that little thing. And so Peter would have us to, to believe this, that if we're, if we're to offer a sacrifice to God in obedience, don't offer a deformed one. Don't offer a lame one. Don't offer one that, you know, like it says in, in Malachi, God says to the Israelites, you're bringing me these sacrifices. You bring that to your governor and you ask him if he'll accept that. So if we're going to come to the Lord with a sacrifice in obedience, brethren, don't come with one that's half half broken. Come with one that's full of heart, full of joy. Number two, not complaining or not having an attitude um, filled with, with complaining that is towards God in His providence in our circumstances. Now here's the reality. This is probably where this hits to most of us most constantly. This is an area probably where we are going to have most difficulty. 
And brethren, the, the grumbling and the complaining that goes on in our own lives and our own hearts about God's providential circumstances in our lives needs to come to an end. It has to come to an end. God has saw fit to do what he has saw fit to do. And for you to complain is to speak of him as a lousy God. I don't like my circumstances, and therefore God has done something that I don't see fit. He hasn't done what I think he should have done. And that's why it comes out. What do we say? Why does this happen to me? And God says, it happened to you because I caused it to happen to you. And I have a purpose in doing it. Now stop complaining and look for the good purpose in it. We need to, we need to remember this. Ecclesiastes 7.14 In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other. And that needs to find application in every circumstance of our life. Number three, we need to be mindful that we are not grumbling or disputing with our fellow Christians. And this, brothers and sisters, is a very ungodly way to deal with your, with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Brethren, it is better to be wronged by another person. And as the scripture says, let love cover a multitude of sins than to go to them in disputings and grumblings that neither build up nor exalt Jesus Christ. It is not helpful to do that, brethren. And Aaron dealt with this last week, but grumbling against your brother or sister or going about murmuring and muttering under your breath about what they did or what they did, that's not how you love them. That's not how you love one another, by bad-mouthing one another. You love one another by forgiveness, not grumbling, not complaining. And oftentimes, brethren, this is a sad thing to see in the midst of, in the midst of a, a church or in the midst of a, a group of Christians when they begin to bite at one another. Paul says in Galatians, you be careful. You be careful if you start to bite at one another that you do not devour one another. So brethren, we need to be mindful that we don't grumble, complain, dispute, with our fellow brothers and sisters. And number four, we ought to be those who are, we ought not be those who are known for grumbling and disputing to the lost world. Brethren, Christians are to be known for much. They ought to be known for a number of things. But one thing they ought not be known for is to be known as a very complaining people, a very a, a very disputing people, a people filled with contention, a person who grumbles and constantly disputes in their workplace, they don't bring honor to Christ. A person who grumbles and complains in their home, filled with disputes with their wife or their husband, they don't bring honor to Christ's name. That type of thing is, ought not be what the lost world categorizes Christians as. And so your behavior to the world it is supposed to be something. It's supposed to be a light. And you know the kind of things that the world spews out of their mouths. You can go on any social media platform and you just start scrolling through people you know what do they say oh this is terrible and that's terrible i hate this person i hate that person i can't believe this is happening whatever and you know this one nothing good happens to me meanwhile they probably sit in their air-conditioned house on a big flat screen computer with a cup of sweet tea right there and they're just complaining about how terrible their life is brother and don't let that mark you and so here's Paul's purpose. And this is where we're just going to spend the rest of the time. I don't know how long it'll be, but this, this is what I want to bring home to you. I mean, the command is so simple. It's, it's almost like what Manny was saying this morning. What more can I say than to you he has said? Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Now let's talk about why you do that. I mean, there's, there's not much else there. You, we need to hear it and do it. So here's his purpose. 
He tells them, stop complaining, because by doing that, by doing, by, be, by complaining and grumbling and disputing, your witness and your light become useless in the midst of a crooked and broken and sinful generation, sinful people. And so Paul desires that these people be blameless. Other translations speak of being faultless, being, being without reproach, that the world can come to you and look at you and not have something to bring against you, that you would be guilt-free. Some translations even translate it harmless, as though the Christian would be but a sheep. I mean, does Jesus not say that? I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. I mean, a sheep's not going to go tear apart a wolf. So this idea is embedded there, that you be blameless, you be innocent, you'd not have blemish, you be harmless, you be faultless in the midst of the world. And here's the deal, brethren. He wants us to be lights. He says that you, that in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So he wants us, he wants us faultless, blameless, innocent, without blemish, so that you could be a you, you could be a, a good, bright light. And here's the reality: if you want the best lighting in a room, you know, you want some lights like this or whatever, you don't always have to go looking for the hottest bulb. Sometimes you can find pretty good, bright light, and it's cool to the touch. And that's what we need to look for. That's what we want to be. Paul wants us to be bright, shining lights, yet not able to be charged with corruption or evil. And those two have to go together. And I remember a number of years ago, this is, this is an example that I just, I thought about in the midst of some of the people that are here, and, and maybe some of you remember, I know my wife will remember this because we, we just talk about it sometimes, but a number of years ago, uh, my pretty much my whole family on my father's side especially just totally dismissed me out of their life because they were told I don't even know by what means but told of what I believed about homosexuality that it was sinful and for those of you who don't know I have a sister who is gay and so that brought major conflict in their mind in our family I had never Never treated her differently, never spoke to her differently, uh, but in their mind there was a there was a serious issue here, and so my family really displayed the mo the height of hypocrisy. I mean, it was so embarrassingly hypocritical that they couldn't even see it. But they basically told me, I will have nothing to do with you. I will not talk to you. I will not see you. I will not even speak of you or think of you because you are in, Ill, intolerant. And it was like, I think you're the one being intolerant. <laughs> so so they, uh, they had accused me of being just, you know, the, the whole nine homophobic, you know, bigot who's hateful and just wants people to die. And it, I mean, there, there was not even a potential for conversation. It was just cut clean and dry. I want nothing to do with you. And they were out. So that went like that for a long time. Um, and, and after some years had passed, and oddly enough, the, the person who was most willing to speak to me was actually my sister. Uh, and I think probably through that, there was some potential for mending some of these relationships. And so as that sort of began to be mended, uh, we moved down here and we began doing barbecues out front at my house and the, and the shoemaker's house. And so we, were, we started these barbecues and the intent of those barbecues was to bring the neighbors, uh, offer them food and, and conversation and ultimately to offer them the gospel and the salvation that we have in Christ. And my father had moved not long after that. He's not but a mile down the road. Um, he lives in a nice little area over there. But he moved there, and, and I think, you know, as the relationship is beginning to be mended, he wants to spend some more time around myself and my wife and my, my, my children. 
So my dad decided he was going to come one day to one of these barbecues. And lo and behold, the barbecue that he decides to come to has the largest group of transvestite cross-dressing prostitutes that roam around this neighborhood that also came to the same barbecue. And so my father shows up and he sees these people who are clear. I mean, when Jesus speaks about the prostitutes and the tax collectors in his day, they were people that the people could look at and go, those are sinners over there. And there's Jesus right in the midst of them. And my father shows up in his nice convertible BMW and pulls up and he sees not just that, but a large number of homeless people as well. And he pulls up and he sees all this homeless people and these, these people who in his mind, he would think I would be out there screaming at them. And what are we doing? We're at the table. We're offering them food. We're offering them probably more conversation than they have ever had in the last probably five years of their life. People don't, when you see these people, listen, brethren, there's no need for false sanctification in here. You and I both know if you saw one of them people, one of those people walking down the street, the first thing you would not do is run up to them and give them a big hug and tell them, I love you and I want to tell you about Jesus Christ. You and I know that. You and I know that. And so it's not as though it was easy to sit with them and speak with them and, and try to engage with them and talk to them about Christ. But that's what he's called us to do, brethren. He's called us to do that. And so my father shows up and he sees this happening. And, and I cannot even explain to you the... My, my father probably had no ability to even comprehend what was happening before him because he had this, this image in his mind that he had put there and he felt it was justified. And so my father sees this undoubtedly. He, he just has an amazing amount of disbelief. What, I, he even said something to, to Kelsey. I don't remember what it was. but and, and even though I am that certain about the disbelief in his mind, I am equally as certain about the fact that that charge of being a hateful bigot who hates people and does not love people fell down like the, the statue of Dagon in the, midst of the, in the midst of the Ark of the Covenant when they brought it into the camp of the Philistines. <laughs> because in the, midst of, in the midst of God's truth, that type of thing can't stand. The, it had no ground to stand on, brethren. He could not validate his opinion. It's not possible in the midst of that. And so I don't, I don't know. I've never really spoken to him uh, in very explicit terms about what he thinks now. But I can tell you this. Jesus said that they hated me without cause. And I will tell you right now, my father still has hate in his heart towards not only myself or my wife, but any Christian that he met that day, he does it without cause. He has no cause to do that, brethren. He can't. It can't be validated. And some of you saw this the other day down at the abortion clinic. A guy's there, and he is about as hostile as you can find somebody to be. I mean, walks out of where he's at to come and stand, almost sets himself up as a volunteer security guard for everybody that's going to come into the come into the abortion clinic. And he's screaming and cursing and, you know, big tough guy out there. And... It didn't take much. I mean, the proverb says a soft answer turns away wrath. And that's true, brethren. That's true. By the end of that situation, I was able to sit with that guy beyond the gate by his own car and talk with him for 15 minutes about the gospel. Same guy that was about to come at me and try to probably punch me in the face not an hour before that. Because we want the world to see Christian people as ones that are harmless and blameless and, and without reproach. And he said to me, uh, part of it had to do with me, me going to him and actually telling him something that I thought was wrong in my conversation with him. And, and, it, and then it, it was him who was saying, you know what, I was wrong in my interaction with you. And and. He, he, I think through some of this, I mean, brethren, the reality is in the world, there are going to be times where we are not what we need to be. And we need to confess that to the world. 
Confessing your, confessing your sin to God is certainly important. But if you've done something, if you've wronged someone, if you've spoken wrongly, and it's to the lost world, don't think that that can go slide under the rug. Deal with that, brethren. Make sure they see you in a way that's blameless and, and faultless. And so, uh, I want to close sort of with this. And this is not necessarily closing in the next five minutes, but this is the last thought I want you to have. <laughs> this, is the last, this is the last, I'm going to close with this thought. All right? I get too much flack from you people. <laughs> Listen, the Bible tells us to be lights. And it tells us that all over the place. Obviously, in our, it's in our passage too among whom you shine as lights in the world. And brothers and sisters, as children of God, you are children of the great King. He is King, and you are children of Him, and you dwell in His kingdom. But here's the reality. You are not the only ones that live here right now. You are not the only ones that walk and live in this place. The problem is there are a lot of others that live and walk here too. And they live and they walk in darkness. And by such they are crooked and evil and perverse and twisted and in darkness. And they know not the glory of the king that you know. They don't know that his rightful place is not only your king, but also as their king. You know, the world tells us, that's fine, you can have that. I'm just going to do my own thing. No, no, no. Jesus says he's my king and he's your king. You need to bow the knee to him. That's his rightful place. But the Lord does not, or the, the world does not believe that. They, like many, you remember this, 2017, what did people have signs on the television saying? Not my president. Not my president. And what do people have over their heads spiritually in this world? Jesus Christ is not my king. They don't want to believe it. They refuse to accept the reality that Jesus Christ is king. And, and here's, this, here's the deal. This king will, no doubt, deal with that. He's not okay with rebellious subjects. He's not okay with that. But how does he deal with it? Does he send out his army to chop the heads off of rebellious subjects and leave them laying on the ground? He doesn't do that. He sends out his people as representatives, as those who would be lights in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation to speak on his behalf about himself and about His kingdom, and about its value, that it is worth more than anything they think they possess now. So he, he commissions you as one to go out, be a light to them. But brethren, I ask you this, how will you do that? How will you go out as one who is the child of a king into his kingdom to proclaim the greatness of the king and the greatness of the kingdom if you constantly walk around grumbling and complaining? What are they going to see you like? That king is, who's that guy? They're always complaining over there. I don't want his king. So brethren, we, we need to be lights that speak highly of the greatness of the king and his kingdom. We need to be lights that, 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 are, that are occupied with joy. That are occupied with joy. And Bunyan speaks about this. John Bunyan <laughs> writes something like this in his book, Holy War. Um, those of you who have read Pilgrim's Progress, I encourage you to go read Holy War. Um... Just my opinion, I don't think anything can be as good as Pilgrim's Progress. But if Pilgrim's Progress didn't exist, this would probably be my favorite fictional story. But here's what this is about. Holy War is about a town called Mansoul. And Mansoul becomes corrupted and enslaved by Diabolus, evil king. He's the devil, okay? And what happens is King Shaddai hears about this. And he sends his son, Prince Emmanuel, to come in and remove that wicked ruler from his throne and to place himself as king over Mansoul. And so he does this. He battles Diabolus and he defeats him. He battles all the rebels of the city, defeats them, and he conquers the city. And then he's rightly crowned as king. 
But the book doesn't end there. In fact, that's only probably the first 50 or 60 pages of the book. And then what ensues after this is this reality that now these people who have conquered and they've crowned him as king are to go out and to announce Prince Emmanuel as king and call the people now to come and to serve their rightful king. And so how does, the, how does he do this? Well, he doesn't do it by brute force. If you read through it, you find that Prince Emmanuel actually writes a letter. And he writes a letter that proclaims mercy to all those in the kingdom. And in case you missed the connection, brother, and this is how we as the children of lights need to shine in the midst of the world. And so I want you to hear how this story unfolds. This is just a small excerpt here from this. Here's what it says. This is after the battle's done. Battle's been done. They've conquered. They've crowned Prince Emmanuel king. And here's what it says. The prince commanded a herald to be called and ordered him to sound the trumpet and proclaim throughout the camp of Emmanuel that the prince, the son of Shaddai, had acquired a perfect conquest and victory over man's soul in his father's name and for his father's glory. They did as he commanded. And music flowed from the heights above, filling the camp with a mel mel melodious harmony. The captains who were in the camp shouted, and the soldiers sang songs of triumph to the prince. Colorful banners waved in the wind, and a great joy filled the camp. The only thing lacking at this point was that the hearts of the men of Mansoul still needed to be reached. The prince called for the prisoners to come into his presence. And he said, The sins, trespasses, and iniquities that you and the whole town of Mansoul have committed against my father and me over time, I have power and authority from my father to forgive. And I do forgive you accordingly. Having said this, he gave them a written parchment sealed with seven seals. It contained a broad general pardon, which he commanded the Lord Mayor to proclaim, so that by sunup the following day, the whole town of Mansoul would have heard it. Furthermore, the prince stripped the prisoners of their mourning garments and dressed them in beauty instead of ashes. The oil of joy replaced mourning's, and the garment of praise displaced the spirit of heaviness. When the prisoners heard the gracious words of Prince Emmanuel and saw all that was done to them, they grew quite faint. For the grace, the benefit, and the sudden and glorious pardon felt so enormous, they couldn't take it all in without staggering. They fell before the prince, kissed his feet, and wet them with their tears. And as they cried out in a strong voice, Blessed be the glory of the Lord. Then the prince said to them, Rise, go to the town, and tell Mansoul what I have done. He commanded a flute and a small drum to play before them all the way into the town. Then what they had never looked for was accomplished for them. For now they possess something greater than they had ever dreamed of. Brethren, this is, this is what we're called to as lights to the world. If you know the gospel, you know the promises that are there. The forgiveness that is held out for people. We were talking about this morning sitting here. Those promises of Christ. And, and, and we talked about it earlier here. I mean, brethren, Jesus says, Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. Whoever comes... That, that is a bright light in the midst of a crooked generation to say, whoever would come to Christ, he would have you. And we have that message. We have that gospel to go out and to proclaim. And that gospel is one of joy. It's not one of complaining, brethren. What do we have to complain about when Jesus Christ is king? So you as a child of the king, brethren, as it said in Pilgrim's Progress, once or, 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 or holy war, once a rebellious subject, once one who hated the king, and now he's accepted you in. 
And your job is one to magnify the king. It's not to be constantly fretting and lamenting and disputing and grumbling and complaining. That doesn't magnify the king. You imagine these people in Mansoul, the, the prince comes in and gives them a letter of pardon, and he says, go in and tell the people, proclaim the pardon. And they're going in and going, well, now we've got to rebuild the city. Here's a message of forgiveness for you, and a message of forgiveness for you. Brethren, that, wouldn't, that doesn't fit. They're going out in joy. So by doing so, we need to be those lights. By those filled with joy, not disputing, not complaining, not, not grumbling all the time, we will be a light. By doing the opposite, brethren, our light is dimmed. It's diminished. And by doing so, does it not show that the king that we call others to worship is not really worthy of his worship? If we walk around as those in that state of mind, why would they think that he's of great value or that his kingdom is of great value? So brethren, I just say this again. Stop grumbling. Stop complaining. Stop disputing. Again, Christ is king. I mean, what do we have to... We worship the king. He's in control of all things and he is sovereign over all things. We really have much to rejoice for and little to complain about. So be a light, brethren. Be a light. Be a light in the midst of a crooked generation. Be a light that Jesus says would, would have others to see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what we want. So let's pray.